Hi, I'm David, and this is the Biology Classroom. This is a paper discussion video, so get ready with this paper, and let's go through the questions and answers together. Question 1 is about egg albumin and burette assay. There is some information on how burette reagent can be used to test the presence of albumin, which is a type of protein. In the presence of albumin, the solution turns purple when burette reagent is added. The intensity of purple increases as the concentration of albumin increases. We can use a calorimeter to measure the intensity of the purple color form. Figure 1.1 shows us that when the color is more intense, the reading of absorbance is higher. A. Outline how a calorimeter is set up for a correct measurement of the intensity of a colored solution. Before we can use a calorimeter, we need to calibrate it. This is to teach the calorimeter what kind of solution is considered zero. It will then compare all the other solutions with its first solution and generate values for them. In this experiment, water is used to calibrate the calorimeter. We can do so by placing a cuvette with water into the calorimeter and setting the absorbance to zero. Another thing that is usually done is that we can use a colored filter. This is to set the wavelength we want to use in the experiment. B talks about an experiment done by a student to determine the concentration of protein in egg albumin from some eggs. A calibration curve needs to be produced by preparing a range of standard solutions with non-concentrations of protein. Question 1 says that the range we want is 0.1 to 1% weight in volume. The question wants you to describe how you could use a stock solution which is 1% to prepare a 0.1% solution of protein. Then, you have to construct a table to show the other concentrations and how they are made. To dilute a solution by a dilution factor of 10, we need to add the stock solution with distilled water in a 1 to 9 ratio. With that said, to prepare a 0.1% solution, we can add 1 cm cube of 1% protein solution to 9 cm cube of distilled water and mix them well. The resulting solution is 10 cm cube of 0.1% protein solution. If you are not sure how to use the ratio to do this, you may use the formula M1V1 equals to M2V2 to do the calculation. Now, let's make the table. The other concentrations I chose are 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0.9%. You may choose other concentrations, but make sure they are at least 5 in total. In this table, you must include the volume of the 1% stock solution and the distilled water added to gain full credit. I am making 10 cm cube each. It is fine if you choose another volume. 2. Identify the independent variable and dependent variable. The independent variable is the protein concentration, and the dependent variable is the absorbance when measured by calorimeter. 3 wants you to label the axis of the graph and sketch the expected calibration curve. The x axis is our independent variable, protein concentration and the y-axis is the absorbance. Remember to write the units as well. Then, draw a line showing a positive correlation, since the greater concentration of protein will give a greater intensity of purple after Burek's assay. A straight line or a curve is acceptable for this situation. 4. Explain why different proteins of the same concentration will result in the same intensity of purple color in the Burek test. According to the information at the beginning of the question, the purple color is a result of copper 2 ions binding with nitrogen atoms that form peptide bonds. Since different proteins with the same concentration will have the same number of peptide bonds, there should be the same number of copper ions binding with the proteins, giving the same intensity of purple color. In question C, we have to describe how the student would use the standard protein concentrations prepared in B1 to obtain a calibration curve and determine the concentration of protein in the X albumin from the X sample. In an experiment design question, you need to include these six components. The best thing to do is list down all the points you want to include, then arrange them in sequence in your answer. Firstly, prepare all the protein concentrations needed. Then, Dilute the X suspension by a factor of 10. We have to do this as the question mentioned in part B that the X sample must be diluted to be used in a burette assay. 
at 1 cm cube of each protein concentration and ate into 6 separate test tubes. After that, at 1 cm cube of burette solution into all of the test tubes. If you are not sure what is the logical volume to use, you can just say that you add the same volume. We can add another control variable here. The burette solution used in each test must have the same concentration. Stir the protein solutions, egg and burette reagent using a glass rod to mix them well. Allow one minute for color development. Transfer the solutions into six different cuvettes and measure the absorbance using a colorimeter. To increase the reliability, make three replicates for each protein concentration and egg to calculate the mean. Once we have all the results, plot the calibration curve and use interpolation to find protein concentration in egg. Remember to multiply protein concentration in the egg by the dilution factor to obtain the actual concentration of protein as we diluted it just now to use for the test. Lastly, name a hazard, identify the risks, and discuss necessary precautions. You need all three of them to get this mark. For example, burette reagent is a hazard. It is an irritant. As a precaution, we should wear gloves and goggles throughout the experiment. Question 2 is about Huntington's disease. A study shows that people with the disease have a higher urea concentration in a specific region of their brains. A study was carried out to investigate the increased urea concentration in a group of sheep with a gene called OVT73. This is a mutant allele of the Huntington gene. A. Describe two features of an appropriate control group for this investigation. To make valid comparisons between the control group and the test group, some important control variables must keep constant. These include the same number of each sex with the test group, same age, which is 5 years old, same breed or type of the sheep, same or at least similar mass or size as the test group. And most importantly, they do not have the mutant allele that can cause Huntington's disease. B talks about whole genome RNA sequencing. This experiment produced gene expression profiles for comparison. 24 genes that are related to urea concentration in the cell were described as genes of interest. Explain why it was more appropriate to use RNA sequencing rather than DNA sequencing for the identification of this gene of interest. The aim here is to know the gene expression of a cell. DNA sequencing only identifies the presence of genes in the cell. It does not function like RNA sequencing, which identifies those active genes in the cell which are switched on and expressed. Besides, there are more copies of mRNA compared to DNA in a cell. For a diploid organism, there are only two copies of each gene. But the number of mRNA can be much higher depending on the level of a gene that is being transcribed. With that said, the quantity of RNA in the cell indicates the level of gene expression. C shows us the comparison of 10 genes of interest between the OVT73 and the control group. The difference between them is expressed in ratio. 1. State which statistical test would have been used to establish the statistical significance between the data sets and explains why the test chosen was suitable. A t-test should be used as we are comparing means between two samples with fewer than 30 values. On top of that, this is continuous data and has a normal distribution. You only need to have one of these points to get a mark. 2. State the null hypothesis for the investigation. In a t-test, we always hypothesize that the difference between the mean values we are comparing is not significant. 3. Explain the advantage of calculating the ratios. Expressing the data in ratio allows us to make comparison more easily. The value let us identify if OVT73 mean counts were higher or lower than the control. Then, use data from table 2.1 to support marking point number 2. For example, you can say that only two genes were lower for OVT73 as their ratios are smaller than 1, while the first eight were higher as their ratios are more than 1. D. 
state one feature of the study that contributes to the validity of these results and one feature that would improve the validity of these results. Note that the first question wants you to identify something that has been done to ensure validity, while the second question wants you to suggest something that was not done. Firstly, two different testing kits were used instead of only one. This reduces the chance of having anomalies. The kits used are commercial kits, so they are probably pretty accurate as they are products that are already in the market. Lastly, statistical tests or analysis were carried out to compare the data. Some improvements can be made including increasing the sample size by testing more sheep. We can also reanalyze the tangents using kit 1 as a method to double confirm the results. Lastly, we can test the same tissue samples again to replicate the study to improve the reliability of the data. In E, we have another table showing the concentrations of urea in three tissue samples. A gene called SLC14A1 showed differential gene expression at a significant level in these regions. Question 1 wants you to calculate the ratio for the motor cortex. It is 69.9 .9 divided by 52.7, which equals 1.33. Use only two decimal places as that is how the other values are written in the table. 2. Explain how the standard error values for mean urea concentration are good indicators of the estimates of statistical significance. The overlapping of standard error ranges between two data indicates a non-significant difference between them. So, according to the table, we can see that for the anterior stratum, the standard error ranges do not overlap suggesting there is a significant difference. For the cerebellum and motor cortex, however, the ranges do overlap, so there is not a significant difference between them. 3 tells us the role of SLC14A1. Explain the relationship between the results shown in Table 2.2 and the increased gene expression shown by SLC14A1. There is more urea in those cells, so more transport proteins were synthesized for more removal of urea. In F, we have three possible causes of increased urea concentration in cells. You have to explain why the results of this study indicate that possible causes 1 and 2 are less likely to be involved in the early stages of Huntington disease than possible cause 3. 1 is unlikely to be the cause as in 2B, we were told that none of the genes coded for enzymes in the urea cycle. 2 is also unlikely to be the reason, as in the third paragraph of question 2, it says that, at the time of the study, OVT73 were 5 years old and had no detectable loss of striatal neurons or disease symptoms. 3 is the most possible cause because in E3, we learned that when there is more urea being produced, a greater gene expression occurs to synthesize the transport proteins, so cells require more energy for this process. That's all for today. If you think my videos are useful, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.